Hello. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, teachers. Can you hear me okay? I heard a woo. Um, but we do have some folks tuning in from home, so I just want to give our virtual uh, attendees a quick shout out. We don't see you, but we're excited you're joining us. Um, but thank you also to the teachers, our local teachers in the DMV area who made the trek out tonight um, in honor of you. This whole night is about thanking our local teachers, our national teachers, um, for everything that you do. And I can't even begin to name everything that you do. And one night is not enough to celebrate you. Let me just make that clear. Every day you get up and you make the choice to be with other people's children all day long. And we thank you. <laughs> As a parent, thank you. Um, but seriously, here at Mount Vernon, we really see uh, your role in society as a civic one. Every day, you are civically engaged in the civic act of instructing our youth. And thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts, because all of the teachers that we've met and know and come to love, we know all the amazing things that you're doing and how hard you're working. So again, I know this isn't enough, but it's what we can do and we're gonna celebrate and we're gonna have the best time tonight. Uh, people at home, again, thank you, thank you. Whatever states you're tuning in from, we we see you in theory, um, but we are just so appreciative for what everyone's doing in the United States in, in terms of education these days. So thank you so much. Um, a, a last minute greeting. My name's Alyssa Oginski. I'm the manager of teacher learning here at Mount Vernon. If you're with us in person tonight, please come find me, say hello. I'll be talking to you at the end as well. And if you're at home, find our email and email us all your questions. We have programs for students, for teachers, and we want, we want you to all know about them, including tonight, our educators evening. But I'm gonna stop talking and introduce um, our director of learning. Her name's Tremia Jackson, and she's gonna talk to you a little bit more about those wonderful things that we do here at Mount Vernon for students and teachers. Tremia? Thanks, Alyssa, and thank you all so much for coming here today. Um, I wanna reiterate, um, Melissa and our team um, always say in our offices that you are um, so special and amazing, and we're just so thankful here at Mount Vernon that you choose to bring your students here, that you choose to come here and do um, our activities and work with us. Um, I just came back from Oregon for a trip um, at a civics conference. And again, to our national teacher, teachers nationally, thank you so much for all the wonderful work that you do um, to get our programs um, out to their students. Um, you know, before we begin, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to celebrate the hard work of two students who won Mount Vernon Student of the Year for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, this is one of our programs that we do um, that are student focused. Um, the Student of the Year Award is given to two projects each year, recognizing outstanding middle and high school students who apply their understanding of Washington's life and legacy to classroom or community-based projects. The award is part of the Mount Vernon Prize for Excellence in Civics and History in honor of Dr. Jennifer London. We are thrilled to say that its sponsor, Dr. London, is joining us tonight. Um, and we wish to greatly thank her for her continued support of students' education at Mount Vernon and in the classroom. I'm just gonna clap her quick for her. For the 2022 school year, we honored, we are honored to celebrate the work of our middle school winner, Anthony Labib from Montclair Academy in Montclair, New Jersey. He used the current environment of the COVID pandemic as an inspiration to study how people in the past handled similar situations. In his paper, he laid out the challenge Washington faced through the threat of smallpox while serving as commander in chief of the Continental Army. It was well researched and provided great background information on the devastation of the disease and how and why it affected the British and American sides differently. Anthony did a great job presenting the challenge Washington faced, the large decisions he made to confront those challenges and the impact those decisions had on both the health of soldiers 
and the outcomes on the award. For the award, Anthony received a $1,000 cash prize. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we are also honored to celebrate the work of our high school winner, Maria Caval from Stevens Point Senior High School in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Mariah is an exchange student from uh, Charniv, sorry, I'm gonna miss this up, Cherniev, Ukraine, and wrote on how Washington's words and his actions in the fight for democracy inspired her to use her own words and actions to help Ukraine's fight from afar. She was given presentations, she has given presentations, speeches, and fundraisers all centered on helping people understand the importance of democracy in Ukraine and their history of fighting for personal rule, building those connections to the history and ideals of America's founding. She used George Washington's legacy as her own call to action and showed how history can have personal influence and impact on our lives today. Something that all of you as teachers, I'm sure, um, and still in your students as well. She made the, the historical relevancy personal where others tend to make it generic. For the award, Mariah received a $5,000 cash prize. <laughs> Along with celebrating the 2022 Student of the Year Award winners, we're excited to say the nominations for the 2023 school year are now open. We encourage teachers to nominate eligible students who have taken their knowledge and created classroom and created classroom or community-based projects based on George Washington's story, legacy, or civic contributions. There's even obviously a cash prize for those students for the students uh, teacher. I can hear you guys, yeah. Just like thinking about that. Yes. <laughs> I'll say that again. There's even a cash prize for the winner student's teacher. <laughs> More information can be found on our website, um, the handouts that we gave you as well on your way in. Um, through this award, we're excited to hear from students themselves and why they think Washington's biography is important and relevant to their lives today. Because of the generous support of Dr. London, we are thrilled Mount Vernon gets to offer this prize directly to students. Now, I would like to welcome our very special guest for the evening. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Martha Washington. Oh, Hello, friends. What an honor to welcome you to our beloved home this night. Do you know, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the most common questions I am asked here at Mount Vernon, who is your favorite visitor? And if you promise not to let it out, it is our teachers. It is all of you. The general and I know so well that our country cannot move forward without the next generations. I tell your students when they come here, you know, it was my generation that birthed the country into being. You'll have to carry it forward. I, I tell them it isn't if, but when and that you are stewarding them on that path. Why, both the general and I are so honored by your presence here. Oh, you know, I never had an academical education. Uh, my mother taught all of us to read and to write. And when I say all of us, I was the eldest of eight children. Oh, my education was a very practical one. I was taught everything of household management and economy. And so that would be to feed your family, which I warn you is a good deal more than baking and cookery. Girls learn to butcher salt, smoke and cure meat, to pickle and dry fruits and vegetables. I was taught to clothe the family, to spin and weave and sew. And of course, ladies are family doctors and you're trained in all the cures and remedies. The health of your family is in your hands. And well, my father was a prosperous planter. He owned, oh, some 500 acres on the south bank of the Pamunkey River. That's in New Kent County, Virginia, just outside the old capital. And when I was growing up, my father owned about 20 people. 
But none of them labored in our house. They toiled in the fields, producing tobacco and wheat. So mother and I did all of that housekeeping. I was the eldest of eight, and I had three brothers before my sister was born. Now, the boys had their chores. But I learned how to run a house from the time I was very small. And I confess to you, I grumbled about that as a girl. My father was a gentleman. He was the clerk or secretary of our county courts. Do you know my Uncle William, his brother, had been a member of the governor's council? I once went to mother. I thought myself quite clever. Mama, it would be very economical. Of course, a woman with eight children, that was her favorite word. You need only hire one tutor, and you will have several learned children. <laughs> she smiled and said, my dear, the best education is that which prepares a child to be of use in the world. Now, when I was 18, my life changed a great deal. I had been courted by our neighbor, Mr. Custis, and, well, even within the landed gentry, there are tears. Uh, I'll put it this way. To my father's 500 acres, my first husband owned 17,500 acres. He owned more than 300 people, so I no more did that drudgery work of housekeeping. I was directing that work done by others, and, well, of course, I had uh, four children in just six years. Uh, sadly, my eldest son, Daniel, and my eldest daughter, Fanny, perished while they were yet infants, and I myself had only just turned 26 when poor Mr. Custis died. You know, people hear that the general married a widow lady, and they think they picture an older person. But I was still a young woman, and I was a busy woman as a widow. Uh, may I see a show of hands? Who has been told and who has told others that I was the wealthiest widow in Virginia? Ah, a few honest souls. <laughs> Well, it's true. There was wealth. I'd mentioned the land Mr. Custis owned, all of the people. There was livestock. There was money and shares in the Bank of England. And I didn't inherit any of it myself. Not really. Daniel had died quite suddenly, and he had never made a will. So all the estate was put into a trust for my two youngest children. Uh, Jack and Patsy were not yet three years of age when their father died. So I was widow administratrix. And I managed that estate on my own during the year and a half of my widowhood. And friends, when I say 17,500 acres, that was not one parcel. It was spread across five different counties as well as the city of Williamsburg. So that's six courthouses for all those legal documents. Of those that toiled in our fields produced tobacco and wheat. And at that time, I would have it shipped to London. My agent, Mr. Carey, would sell it for me and then purchase and send back the goods I had ordered. So I was corresponding with farm managers across Virginia, as well as my business associates in London. And I was still responsible for the domestic side of things. Uh, about eight months after I lost Mr. Custis, I received a note from a neighbor of mine inviting me to come for a visit. Well, it was March, and I thought I hadn't time to go. But I reconsidered. I thought, well, I could manage all the business correspondence from her home. And, uh, well, I hadn't seen Mrs. Chamberlain in some time, so I did go. And while I was visiting with the Chamberlains, a soldier was riding towards Williamsburg. Can you guess his name? Yes, he was Colonel Washington then. And, you know, he was never near Williamsburg. He was out in the western wilderness of the Ohio fighting the French. But he had dispatches for the governor, and he was seeking a physician's advice. Uh, soldiers, you know, are much plagued with the various illnesses we call camp fever. And he had found no relief. Well, as he crossed the Pamunkey coming into New Kent, whom did he meet but Major Chamberlain, husband of the lady I was visiting? And the Major insisted he come home. I'll, I'll never forget it. Mrs. Chamberlain and I were in her parlor, and... Her husband and Major burst into the room, dragging poor Colonel Washington behind him. Ladies, the Colonel insists he will go to Williamsburg this day. I insist he will stay to dinner. And I could tell, having been brought up to care for sick people, that there was something troubling him. As politely as possible, I asked the nature of his malady, and, oh, he was having trouble in his belly, and who wants to sit down to a long meal when you're ill that way? So I made up a remedy I knew. And do you know, he took it from my hand without question. 
I later reflected that was a good sign. Well, it eased his distress and he did stay to dinner. And it was the next morning before he continued on to Williamsburg that Colonel Washington asked if he could call upon me at my own home. And I told him that would be agreeable. Does anyone know how many visits before he popped the question? Two, it was the second visit. It seemed rather quick, but you know, he had commitments to General Forbes and, well, it was the following January on 12th night that he and I were married and he didn't bring me to Mount Vernon straight away. You know, Virginia can be quite cold at this time of year. And that was a very long journey, five days in a carriage. So he waited till the springtime and uh, we arrived on the seventh day of April in 1759. Do you know, I have never regretted coming here, and my great hope is that when our visitors depart, they feel the same way. For the next 15 years, our, our lives continued, uh, well, as I had predicted they might. Uh, we had our plantation here. We often went down to Williamsburg. You know, he was then a member of the House of Burgesses. My children were raised right here. Do you know, I never had to remind the children to think of him as their father. From the very first, they called him Dearest Papa. Uh, unlike the general and myself, my children had an excellent education. As soon as they came out of the nursery, we hired Mr. McGowan, and he taught them grammar, history, French, drawing, mathematics. They had music lessons with Mr. Stadler. Jack played the violin, Patsy the harpsichord. And, uh, of course, dancing lessons are a requirement. Uh, in Virginia, dancing is our dearest diversion, you know. And I'm afraid that, well, the frailties of human nature, uh, we did not escape them in our family. When Jack was old enough, we sent him to study Latin and Greek with a, a minister in Annapolis. Do you know, uh, the general got a letter from the Reverend Boucher that perhaps nature had not formed my son to be a scholar. His habits and appetites were more like that of a prince. <laughs> of course, he'd had everything handed to him from the time he was little, but the general was adamant that we use their late father's wealth to give them every opportunity. As I said, I thought our lives would go on as, as so many others, but everything changed in the spring of 75. Uh, as a member of the House of Burgesses, he had been selected to represent Virginia in the Congress up in Philadelphia. He had gone in the autumn of 74. And, well, I remember he rode out of here. I, I waved him off at the gate and turned into the house to oversee so much of the work. And I expected him home in a few weeks. You know, it was the very next day that we in Virginia learned what had happened at Lexington and Concord. Of course, now they're called the shots heard around the world. But remember then, our disagreements with Parliament had been going on for 10 years, and it wasn't the first time violence had broke out. There had been the massacre in Boston, and well, everyone talks of when the people in Boston threw the tea in the river. Why don't they ever talk about how the Marylanders set the tea ships on fire? <laughs> I'll never know. So I figured that some peaceful compromise would be got. And then in June, I received my first ever letter from General Washington. When he left here in April, he left here a colonel. But having had more experience in a military life than almost any other man in all the colonies, they had promoted him to a general. He wrote that he was going up to Boston to take command of the army gathering there. And in the letter he wrote, I look forward, my dearest, to a happy reunion with you at Mount Vernon, sometime in the fall. <laughs> of course, he did not return that fall or for many autumns after. In fact, in October, it was clear he would not get home, and he wrote again, would I come and join him? And, you know, at that point in my life, I, I don't think I'd been much farther north from Mount Vernon than Alexandria. But if you're not familiar, that's about eight miles from where we are. <laughs> And when I got to Boston, I was overcome. I had never seen war before. I did not understand really then the privation and want that it brings. I used to shudder when I would hear the cannons flying. And of course, Boston had been under siege for months. Do you know the people who had stayed in the city ran out of firewood? They had to pull up the wharves and burn that to heat their homes that winter. 
And of course, all of those winter months, our General Knox and his men were coming towards Boston, and they carried with them a great treasure, the cannon captured at Fort Ticonderoga. And when they got to the camp at Cambridge, the general had them placed on the Dorchester Heights, out of range of the enemy fire, but pointed right at their ship. So oh, the enemy sailed away. Of course, at that point, the war had just begun. And I agreed with the general that I should go to Philadelphia and be inoculated for smallpox. I, I think, my dear, I'd like to see that young man's project about the smallpox. It's very important. Uh, I know you're going to be eating, and I don't wish to turn your stomachs, but let me assure you, it is not pleasant to be inoculated. The physician will cut the fleshy part of the arm and a bit of thread that's passed through the pustule of someone with smallpox that's pressed into the wound. And so you get some sick. It takes several weeks to recover. Of course, once you're recovered, you never need fear of the smallpox ever again. In fact, during the war, when my four grandchildren were born, we had each of them inoculated before they were six months old. It's much safer than catching it the natural way. But there I was, friends, recovering from the inoculation in the city of Philadelphia in the summer of 1776. And a very important document was written that summer, wasn't it? If I were a prophetess, my prediction is that document, our Declaration of Independence, it's not only going to change this country, its effects, I be believe, will be felt around the world and perhaps even reverberate down the centuries. And, uh, of course, when they wrote it, uh, I, I thought, what will happen next? Of course, today we celebrate the anniversary of the document. On the 4th of July, there are picnics and barbecues, illuminations. I wonder sometimes if future generations will, will think, what was it like when we had declared independency, but it had not yet been won? Now, I went to every winter camp. I was there not only at Boston, but at Valley Forge in Morristown and Newburgh. I know how brave our soldiers were. But remember, they were farmers and shopkeepers, apprentice boys. They were women that donned breeches and went to fight. And of course, the enemy, <laughs> the best trained, and better yet, the best provisioned military force in all the world. I did not dwell on the thought, but I knew if we did not succeed, that it would be the general taken to London. My mother had lots of words of wisdom for me when I was a girl, and she used to say, you are never to despair. To despair is to turn your back on divine providence. So as soon as I recovered from my, my inoculation, I returned here to Mount Vernon and to what I had been taught by my mother. Now, here at our plantation, Jenny, Phyllis, and Anthony spin and weave. They make linen and wool cloth, and that's used to clothe those that labor at our farms. And I remember returning saying, we've got to produce more than we'll need. I, I want enough for our people, but I want surplus to take to the soldiers. Why, even in the early spring, our cooks, Doll and her daughter Lucy, they're laying by making oh, jellies, preserves, chutneys, putting aside dried fruits and vegetables. And I thought, what could we spare? And we began to set aside more for our soldiers. Do you know at Valley Forge, I once saw some enlisted men pull bark off a tree. They boiled it up in some melted snow. That was all they had to put in their empty bellies. I gathered herbs from the garden. I sent a messenger to bring me necessities from the apothecary in Alexandria. So every year when I would return to the camps, I would bring the supplies. But of course, I'd been inoculated for the smallpox. It was safe for me to go amongst the enlisted men. And you know, nursing our soldiers during the war, that's the greatest privilege I have ever known. And uh, at places like Valley Forge and Morristown and Newburgh, I used to fancy I, I could hear mother whispering in my ear, did I not tell you, child, the best education will be prepare you to be of use. My goodness, how right she was. <laughs> oh, friends, I have just demonstrated my one failing I have never yet been able to conquer. 
I can talk a very long time without stopping, <laughs> and that's terribly uncivil. I, I know that you will have questions, things that you're curious about. Uh, these charming ladies will come around with microphones, and uh, I'd be happy to answer anything that you're particular curious about. <laughs> Hi. Hello, my dear. What local places like around here did you and the general hang out at? Oh, well, up until they left, our dearest friends were also our nearest neighbors. Uh, George William and Sally Fairfax lived just three miles south of here at a plantation called Belvoir. And, oh, for those 15 years before the war, they were well, frequent guests here and us to their plantation. Now, before the war, too, we were subscribers to the Alexandria Assembly. So every month there would be a subscription ball. And, you know, even now, General Washington is the greatest dancer in Virginia. So once a month we would go and we have a, a townhouse on Cameron Street. It's not uh, fully fitted out with all the outbuildings. We don't stay there for long periods. But when we would go to the ball, we'd often stay there. And a ball will begin at about uh, 10 or 11. There'll be several hours of dancing, and you might have supper at 1 in the morning. And if you wish to continue dancing, it'll continue on till dawn. But our dear friends, the Carlyles and the Ramses, and uh, if you're looking, we have a tenant property uh, on Pitt Street, very conveniently located. And we have attended services at Christ Church. And, well, we're getting older, and I've put away my dancing slippers, but we still go to the birth night ball that's held by uh, Mr. Gadsby at the City Hotel there on Royal Street. Of course, the general's history with Alexandria goes back to its founding as a young man studying surveying. One of his exercises was to draw a map of the place. And, well, he has been a magistrate. He has been a trustee of the city. As I said, we are property owners there, and he's been a vestryman at Christ Church. So we spent a great deal of time in Alexandria. Yes, there's a lady here that has a question. Can you pass that down? Thank you for your wonderful testimony of your life. And so my question is, I believe that uh, George Mason and his wife uh, opened their mansion, Gunston Hall, which is near here. I believe it was 1759, and I believe you said you came here in that year. And I've heard, and I wanted to see, is it true that the two of you, the two couples, were quite friendly with one another and would often be at each other's homes for dinner? Oh, indeed. And uh, unfortunately, Mr. Mason is not so active as the general. Uh, the general would often have the, the fox hunts that go around there, and the Masons would open their homes to us, the most generous couple. And well, not only did we know them socially, but the very first, it was called the Association of Non-Importation. And that was in 69, so 10 years after I came here as a bride. And uh, that was the general and Mr. Mason drafted that, that to protest the latest taxes, we in Virginia would no more import all of these goods. And it was the general that then presented it to the House of Burgesses. So they have been together in a, a, a social way, but also in a political. Since then, they haven't agreed on everything. But of course, I think a great strength in our country is that we have many voices. We can debate civilly, of course, all the important issues. So, so you, what you have heard is true, my dear. As I said, I, I could have just said yes or no, but I'll make that circle come full round to meet itself. Thank you. To have communication between your friends in and around the area, was there like a courier that would you could dispatch to let the other party know that you have an event coming up, or would you rely on a regular postal notice? I mean, how how would that work? I mean, did you have like a runner or a 
Often, yes, we would have, um, sometimes it would be Marcus or, or Austin. Um, they work as footmen, but as younger boys, they would often be sent in and about this part of the neighborhood. Again, Virginia, when it was settled, uh, it was mostly farms and plantations. In the old days, one could be 20, 30 miles from their nearest neighbor. So not only did you welcome any traveler that came by, but anyone passing through, if they were going to a place and you wanted to send a message, you would often entrust it to them. Now, since then, we have a national postal service. And uh, one of the benefits of having been the president's lady is I, I have franking covered. I don't have to pay for my post anymore, which I find convenient. You know, it's, uh, it's been an honor to be at the general side, not only during the war, but the presidency. But, of course, that often meant I was very far from those that I love. And when we speak of the pandemic and when we had to, uh, to be safe, stay far away, wasn't it wonderful to, to write and receive messages from those that you love? So I treasure them, though. Often my correspondence proves very uninteresting. Mostly what I want to know is how is everyone's health? And if it isn't good, I'm, I'm, I've got advice for them. <laughs> Other questions? I know Washington um, tried to diversify the views in his cabinet, so he had men ranging from like Jefferson to Hamilton. Um, do you have opinions on any of the men in his cabinet? <laughs> oh, I most certainly do. <laughs> and and that was, I think, one of the most difficult things. You know, he gathered men of learning and experience. He didn't want sink or fence. He didn't want people to just tell him what, what he wanted to hear, to agree with his ideas. But when we found out that Mr. Jefferson was going directly to the newspapers, when he gathered those men, he hoped they would debate, and whatever they determined, they would move forward together. More often than not, Mr. Jefferson would go and well, not even complain about the actual issue at hand, but make personal remarks uh, at the general or myself, which I never really minded. But uh, it, it rather broke his heart. And, well, that man, as I call him, is not welcome at Mount Vernon. And I think what a waste of a, a, a man of such brilliancy, of someone who has seen the world. We spoke of the declaration. He wants to build a university. And to be so duplicitous, what a waste. And of course, I, 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 Alex Hamilton, I've known, you know, he and my son were the same age. In fact, my Jack was at King's College just a few months before uh, uh, Alex Hamilton arrived. And of course, their stories could not be more different. My son, who had everything handed to him. And Alex, of course, had to, to work very hard for everything he achieved. In fact, there were some charming young ladies here yesterday. And, of course, so many of our young people are interested in Alex Hamilton nowadays. I'm glad for it. And I said, you know, his, his example is, is so wonderful. Look what can be achieved. But he must learn circumspection. That, uh, and I asked, these girls must have been, I think, nine. And I asked if they'd heard that word before. And so we spoke, you know, that, that to, to, to always say exactly what you think and feel may not serve you very well. So uh, uh, they are all men who have, uh, and of course, uh, General Knox and, uh, and Edmund Randolph, too, uh, that they rendered the service they did to their country. Uh, they have my thanks, but Mr. Jefferson can take that anywhere but here. <laughs> I'm wondering, what was your favorite part of being the First Lady? Well, coming home. <laughs> Indeed, I wrote, I, I got, so, you know, the general went up uh, ahead of me. And uh, uh, something else I tell our young people, the Constitution was not our first attempt at self-government. Our first attempt was a failure. We don't often speak of that. And I, I don't wish to highlight failures, only that it's very difficult to create something 
that has the right balance of federal and state power. And, uh, uh, and it wasn't easy. They wanted him to go up straight away. And of course, I had two young children that we were going to be bringing with us. I had to pack everything up. When I got to the house on Cherry Street in New York, everything was in chaos. Remember, this wasn't a, a, a sultan or a king in his faraway palace. This was a president elected by the people. They wanted to know him. But what should they do? Let some people come? Well, which people? And at what times? What days? Let nobody come? Well, that was getting a, rather like a, a monarchy. So they let everybody come. And then, oh, he had no time to get the business of government done. Two days after I arrived, I put a stop to all the visitors and I instituted a weekly drawing room. And this would be on Friday night and it was open to the public and I would be sat at one end with some chairs beside me. I was hostess, he was my guest of honor. So if anyone wanted to meet him, they need only let his aide Major Jackson know. The Major would introduce them to me, I could introduce them to their president, they could sit in conversation. And I also would have a private dinner on Thursdays and that would be for sometimes men of the government, a foreign uh, dignitaries, native delegations. And uh, again, when you're brought up to, to run a, a large plantation house, uh, organizing large entertainment such as that, well, that came in very handy. But about four months after I arrived, I wrote to my niece Fanny that I felt like the chief state prisoner. Oh, I am proud that I can say I did my duty. Another thing my mother had me do as a girl, before I was allowed to retire to bed, I had to go to a looking glass. Can you look at yourself, she'd say, and say that you have done your duty today? And so I'm proud that I was there. I, I am honored that I was in the city of Philadelphia as the country passed its first and greatest test. You know, they wanted him to continue on to be a president for life, but he felt so strongly that they must prove that there could be a peaceful transition of power from one administration to another. So to be in Philadelphia as that happened, I, I, I find that a great honor. But even the, the general said, when we, we left, he wrote to a neighbor that we felt like children released from the schoolroom. And so I'm glad to be back at Mount Vernon here welcoming all of you instead of there. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think at some point you're going to feel like burning your letters between you and your husband. And if that's the case, who would tell the best story? Who knew you best and could tell the story about you and your husband? Oh, my goodness. I, you know, I'm often asked about those letters and that you asked about who could tell our story best. Most people don't do that. That's very charming. Uh, that is a very common practice. The letters between two beloveds are seen as private. They're not meant to be read by others. And in fact, the only people that really don't do that will be John and Abigail Adams. So it's a common practice. Now, of course, the general and I have been so fortunate we've never much been separated. Do you know the longest we were apart from one another was just after he made that offer of marriage? from the late spring of 58 until the uh, early January of 59. Other than that, we were never more than a few months separated. So there are not many. I think that uh, my grandchildren will have many fond memories, perhaps a, a little rosy tinted. But uh, my second granddaughter, uh, she was born here at Mount Vernon just a month before I left for Valley Forge and christened Martha in my honor. She's now Mrs. Martha Peter and lives in Georgetown. I think she will be one that will keep so much of, of the family's story together, um, particularly in the collection of objects. And well, here at Mount Vernon, of course, we have so many of our objects on display. When you teach, you often teach with objects the stories they can tell. And uh, so I think she will be one that uh, will we'll, we'll carry a good deal of that forward. Yes, sir. <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, you were in Philadelphia. <clears throat> the first capital was in New York. I realize you didn't 
like either of them, but <laughs> did you favor one over the other? Well, I, I will say New York never gets remembered. We were there a year and a half. And in that first year, the, the general was very ill. He had a, a cancerous carbuncle on his thigh. We almost lost him. Do you know, without anyone asking, the people in New York laid down straw and pine boughs on our street that would muffle the sound of the carriages so that he could get rest. That, that has always remained uh, a memory. I, I can never thank them for that kind gesture. Now, I will say, and anyone who has the care of young children, we delight in seeing them happy, don't we? And our house on the high street, as we called it, it's now called Market Street in Philadelphia. Do you know it was built next door? Mr. Ricketts Circus. So to have two children living next door to the circus, they delighted in that. So uh, those are, are, are both fine points. I don't like to choose. Again, everywhere has given their contribution. I, I remember traveling up to, to Massachusetts in 75. Again, in those days, the colonies thought of themselves almost like different countries. And, but surely the people of New England were very different than we Virginians. And of course, there were differences in, in, in small things. You know, the men of New England take each other's hands to greet instead of making a bow. But as we all united in this common cause of, of independency and self-government, all of those little differences rather melted away. And everywhere, I think, can be proud of the achievements they have added and continue to add. As I, I said when we began, you know, it's never going to be over. There will be always more work to do. And as I said, that's why teachers are my favorite visitors, because you are the ones ensuring that it all endures by your work. And well, we're so very grateful to all of you. Other question. You're wanting to know when we're going to feed you. <laughs> and offer you a beverage that's well-deserved after your long days. <laughs> Mrs. Washington, what's your favorite part of the holidays? We're going to go see the house after yes. this. And but... in a few moments, I must depart to make sure everything's in readiness. But again, to be surrounded by family and friends and to, to, to take time uh, to be grateful for everything that we have. And of course, to look forward to what may come in this new year. Yes, my dear. I'd like to know the relationship between your children and the general. Oh my goodness, they adored him. Now, remember Jack was four and Patsy was two when we married. So they were very young and well, I'll never forget. You know, I had been courted by other men during my widowhood. The general was not the first to make an offer, in fact, Mother didn't speak to me for about two weeks after I turned down Charles Carter. Uh, if you know the old Virginia families, the Carters were, were quite the top tier. Uh, in fact, uh, Charles's father was called King Carter for all his wealth. But uh, that evening in the Chamberlains, uh, it was after dinner, and we'd retired to the parlor, and I, I couldn't remember what we were speaking of, but there was a knock at the door. Uh, it was Rose, the girl who cared for Jack and Patsy. She had brought the children down to say good night. Now, at that point, my son had just turned three, and he saw Colonel Washington, his fine uniform of the Virginia Blues, the sash that Braddock gave him, a sword at his side. Oh, his eyes grew wide. He ran right to Colonel Washington, climbed up onto his lap, and began to tug at the buttons of his coat. Oh, I was mortified. Jack come down from there at once. I said, let the girl alone. He hasn't been well. And I'll never forget. He, he said, madam, it is no bother. And I, I can still see my son sat there on his knee and the general letting him trace his finger over the hilt of that sword. And I knew in that moment I had found their father. My daughter Patsy was afflicted with a sickness that physicians call epilepsy. From the time she was seven, she regularly had uh, seizures and fits and fevers. And well, you can look into the general's ledgers now as her legal guardian. Uh, he was responsible for, for uh, managing her accounts and 
Here's the account for the cost of the physician's visit. Here for whatever treatments or remedies. And generally underneath that, you'd see a line for sugar maple candy or a hair ribbon, a little trifle to cheer her. Once we brought a special blacksmith to make her a, a cramp ring. It's a terrible name. It's an iron ring cold forged to fit the wearer, and it's thought to draw that sickness out of the body. Uh, I'm sure every one of you can remember a time you had to visit the doctor or the dentist and you were anxious and someone had to console you say, no, it won't be, it'll be fine. Well, he didn't want her to worry. So he wrote to the blacksmith, I want you to come and fit Miss Custis out before breakfast. His plan was we would rouse her, have her dressed, it'd all be done before seven o'clock in the morning. That was the father that I found for my children. Other questions? Oh, yes. So you have uh, experienced so many challenges in your life. I'd be curious as to what you would define as the greatest of those challenges. The loss of my children. And uh, it's not unusual. Um, we do only but trust in the wisdom of divine providence. I, I used to try to stop myself from questioning why children would be sent to the earthly plane to be cruelly snatched before they'd reach the age of three or four. And um, of course, my dear Patsy was only 17 when she suffered one of her seizures and uh, never, never roused again. And uh, after that, my son was, was then at King's College and I insisted to the general that he be allowed to come home and marry. He had been sent to King's College because while up in Annapolis, he'd made an offer of marriage to a young lady without asking us or the girl's parents. <laughs> Any of our, our friends from Maryland, it was Miss Eleanor Calvert. So we didn't object to the match but at the time, the girl was 15 and my son not yet 18. So we sent him to go and study, but only lost Patsy. <laughs> I, I told the general, we're not waiting anymore. At that point, I had seen three of my four children depart this plane without men. Well, as I said, during the war, all four of the grandchildren were born. And I never told Jack he could not join our fight for independency. I... I've always suspected the general did. Again, I had been reduced to the lowest ebb of misery with the loss of my dear Patsy. Uh, when the general did return the one time just before Yorktown, Jack came to me and asked if he had my blessing to go as an aide. And, well, he was nearly 27. A father with four children, of course I gave it. And After they left Mount Vernon, we had the happy news a few weeks later that Cornwallis had surrendered. So his wife, Nellie, and their eldest child, Eliza, we three went down. You know, Yorktown's not far from where I was born and raised. And, well, when we got there, the general had to inform us that Jack was very ill. And um, the blessing is that we were with him when he passed. But the, the loss uh, of a child is something no parent can ever truly recover from. And uh, I'm always happy to talk of my children. Uh, if you are ever in Williamsburg, uh, just outside of the church is uh, a little stone. It's getting very worn. I had it cut when my first husband died to remember him and my two eldest children that, that perished so young. So when we remember those we have lost, they're not really gone from us, are they? But I think that is the greatest trial anyone can imagine. Another question I'm often asked, and perhaps you're all too polite to tonight, is uh, why the general and I never had children together. The, again, that's the will of divine providence. Now, I will confess to you, as a younger woman, I was very disappointed. I'd been the eldest of eight. I wanted a large family of my own, but I feel quite different now. As I said, my children called him father. We've raised nieces and nephews and grandchildren. There are many, though the, the general doesn't like it. He's a modest man, but many in our country call him a father of these United States. And uh, for those who perhaps have visited us before, 
there's a very special key in our house. Uh, you'll see it this night. It once opened the main gate of what was called the Fortress of Despotism, the Bastille prison that stood in Paris. And that was given to us after the Bastille was destroyed by a young man who considers himself the adopted son of the general, our dear friend Gilbert, the Marquis de Lafayette. And when he sent the key to the general, he said, it is a symbol of French liberty. I present it to the father of liberty. So my goodness, in that sense, he's father to many, isn't he? And if I'd had a large brood of children as I had wanted as a younger woman, I don't know that I could have gone to all those camps. Uh, again, when our young scholars come, I, I try not to, to, to preach too much at them, but I give them advices and bear your disappointments as best you can. I, I know it isn't easy, especially when you're young. But I assure them, and I know from experience, that one day they will look back on them and they will realize there was another path, another destiny awaiting you. As I'm sure you know, we can't always see it at the time, but I wager each one of you has a memory like that. So, other questions? Yes, here's a lady has one. Come on, come on, come on. All right, you guys pass that down. And It's not such an elegant question, but what was your favorite meal? Oh, oh, I pride myself on the quality of our hams here. As I said, when girls are young, uh, beginning at age seven and eight, you're trained in the art of butchery. Men will slaughter the beast, but women butcher. Again, I was brought up to that final maxim, waste not, want not. You've got to make best use of the animal. And when the lady sits down at her table, she sits at the head, she dishes everyone up, and she carves. So you must know the beasts intimately. Now, I don't do all that butchering myself these days. Uh, we cure 400 hams here at Mount Vernon. And I have a ham boiled up and served on table just about every single day. And uh, so I, I pride myself on those hams. But now we are preparing for the great cake. Our great cake is a traditional cake that's served on Twelfth Night. That's, of course, the last of the 12 days of Christmas. And it's quite an undertaking. It calls for 40 eggs, 4 pounds of butter, 4 pounds of sugar, 5 pounds of flour. Into that, you add mace and nutmeg, candied fruit peels and nuts. Um, my advice, though, bake it up ahead of time. It tends to dryness. So that way you can douse it in brandy. Then have the icing put on, it's very rich. So even now, Doll and Lucy are gathering up everything that will be needed so that we can serve great cake on Twelfth Night. And I often put my hand to that in some fashion or another, for of course it was on Twelfth Night that we were married. And uh, it's not unusual for a lady in my position if there is some special occasion uh, that she wants to uh, display her abilities. Um, so you might make a dish for a special person. But when I was a girl, there was a lady that lived near us in New Kent, and she wanted to make the entire meal. She was so exhausted. You know, it can be 15 or 20 different dishes. So exhausted, she missed the meal. Here at Mount Vernon, Doll and Lucy make a meal like that each and every day. Mm -hmm. But friends, as I said, I, I must away to the house, and I'll see you all shortly. I, I want to make sure everything's in readiness. You know, I don't do any of the drudgery work at Mount Vernon. But if the rooms are dirty, if the dinner's badly prepared, none of you will say, oh, you better get a new cook or train those housemaids. You'll say, oh, Martha Washington doesn't know how to keep house. <laughs> I can't have that. Again, the eldest of eight, those with older sisters, know what it's like to have someone like me in charge. But again, what an honor to have you here. And... Uh, the best wishes for a very uh, fine season, and let us hope and pray for a peaceful new year. Thank you, friends, so much for coming. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Martha Washington, for joining us. Um, and if you could pause there, I would also like to thank Elizabeth Keeney for joining us. Thank you, Elizabeth.
For those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Allison Wickens. I'm Vice President for Education here at George Washington's Mount Vernon. And I wanted to um, take a moment at the podium as well to thank you all for your amazing work in education uh, this last year. Thank you so much. Um, it's at this point though, um, more fun is about to begin. Um, first off, um, we want to um, say good night to those of you tuning in on live stream. Um, don't hang up, there's exciting things for you to view online uh, that the folks in the room will see live and in person shortly. Um, but thank you very much for tuning in to this wonderful pr performance. Um, uh, before I release you, Good evening. Welcome to George Washington's Mount Vernon. You're here tonight to celebrate Mount Vernon by candlelight. You are the guests of the Fairfax family, dear friends of the Washingtons who live just a few miles down the Potomac River. But the Christmas of 1772, they celebrated Christmas here at Mount Vernon. Please follow me. Five hundred years ago, here on the banks of the Potomac River, lived native peoples belonging to three major tribes, the Piscataway, the Dogue, and the Potawatomi. They thrived on the abundant fish and wildlife. But in 1657, George Washington's great-grandfather, John Washington, came to the British colony of Virginia from England and in 1674, he acquired this land. Two generations later, George Washington's father, Augustine Washington, would build a house here that would later become the mansion we know as Mount Vernon. Tonight, we travel back in time 250 years to the year 1772. There were many reasons for the American colonists to be aggrieved with the mother country. We will explore those grievances as we travel this path to the mansion and explore the reasons for the American Revolution. George Washington had reason to be aggrieved as well. And so let us begin on this road to revolution. We'll continue over the next few years as well, Christmas after Christmas, until we arrive at the 250th anniversary of the founding of our country with the Declaration of Independence in 1776. George Washington was born here in the colony of Virginia in 1732. His father would build the house here on this property in 1734. And George would live there with his mother, Mary Ball Washington, and his siblings, younger sister Betty, three younger brothers, Samuel, Jack, and Charles. But when George was about seven or eight, the family moved to Fredericksburg, Virginia. There on the banks of the Rappahannock River, they lived at a property that has come to be known as Ferry Farm. When George was just 11 years old, his father died. And then the property here, known as Little Hunting Creek, was inherited by George's older half-brother, Lawrence Washington. Lawrence served in the British Navy as a Marine under Admiral Edward Vernon. He greatly admired his commanding officer, and so Lawrence renamed the property Mount Vernon. Sadly, Lawrence would die of tuberculosis in 1754. And that is when George Washington would acquire the property here. 
But remember, we're in the year 1772. George Washington is now 40 years old. His wife, Martha Dandridge Custis Washington, is eight months older. And her two children, Jackie and Patsy, are living here at Mount Vernon with their mother and their beloved papa. Jackie, 18 years old, and Patsy, 16. So let's consider what Christmas would have been like for them back in 1772. Christmas traditions then were very different than they are today. Christmas Day itself was a time for faith and family. Those four members of the Washington family may have climbed aboard their horse-drawn carriage and driven the eight miles into Alexandria to attend Christ Church, or perhaps they worshiped at the nearby Pohick Church. There they would have heard a sermon preached by the Anglican clergyman, sung the songs of the Christmas season, repeated the Anglican literature. And after that worship service, they would have come back to Mount Vernon for a dinner with family and exchanging small gifts, tokens of their affection, baubles, books, things like that. The white workers here, the enslaved as well, would be given tokens of affection too. Sometimes money or baubles, sometimes alcohol as well. But after that Christmas day, let the partying begin. Because like all well-to-do Virginian Anglicans, the Washingtons celebrated the 12 days of Christmas. So for the next 12 days, there were feasts, games, entertainments with friends and family, all culminating in the 12th night feast. That was January 6th, Epiphany. And it was a common day to get married. And it was the day that George and Martha Washington had been married back in 1759. So this year, they're celebrating their 14th wedding anniversary. Let's continue on to the house. Our second president, John Adams, late in his life, reflecting on the events of a lifetime, said that the revolution did not begin with the war. Rather, a decade or more before, it began in the minds of the people. As we go along this path tonight up to the mansion, we'll talk about some of the events that inspired that revolutionary thinking in the minds of the people and in the minds of George Washington. For most of his life, George Washington was a loyal British subject. In his 20s, the royal governor of the British colony of Virginia asked George Washington to go into the western wilderness of the Appalachians and deliver a message to the French who had forts there, telling them to leave and relinquish control of those lands to the British. Well, Washington and a man named Christopher Giss did deliver that message. And on the way home, feeling in danger. They had some amazing adventures. On the banks of the Allegheny, they built a raft out of fallen tree branches, put it in the river and started downstream in the icy cold of winter. That raft crashed into a rock, fell apart, throwing both Christopher and Washington into the river. They had to swim to an island in the middle of the river and spend the night without equipment or supplies. In the morning, the river had frozen solid and they were able to walk to safety. <gasps> but what a story! George Washington kept a journal and published that journal, The Allegheny Expedition of George Washington and Christopher Gist, 
With his publication, he became a best-selling author and a folk hero on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, just a few years later, the same governor would send George Washington back into the wilderness. And George Washington would fight for the British in the French and Indian War for control of those lands. Ultimately, the British were victorious and the French were defeated. Then, the British built forts in the wilderness in order to keep the peace between native peoples and American colonists. George Washington owned thousands of acres of land in that western frontier. And when the English issued the proclamation of 1763, they didn't allow him access to those lands. Settlers were not allowed to settle there. The land could not be used at all by colonists. And this, of course, angered and frustrated George Washington. Then the British had to come with, up with a way to pay the soldiers who were manning those forts. And so they enacted the Stamp Act, which required colonists to buy a stamp to affix to all sorts of paper products, like documents, newspapers, even playing cards. It so angered the colonists, it didn't last for long and it was repealed, but it was yet another grievance with the mother country. George Washington, upset about these infringements on their rights as loyal British subjects, would create legislation for the Virginia House of Burgesses. He represented Fairfax County in that governing body, and so he wrote the Non-Importation Agreement, which required people in Virginia to refuse to import products that had been taxed by the British Parliament. And that revolutionary document would be written by George Washington in the house you will be visiting later this evening. In 1772, George Washington's estate covered about 6,000 acres, approximately 140 enslaved people lived on that estate. This brick building, which would later house the enslaved community, didn't exist then. Instead, they lived in a large wooden building and in several one-room cabins spread out across the estate. Those workers worked six days a week, Monday through Saturday, from sunup till sundown. For most of them, Sunday was a day off, and they could go into Alexandria, where members of abolitionist societies taught reading and writing, also shared the world events of the day. Imagine, too, those enslaved people that worked in the Washington's house. Breachy was the butler. Frank Lee was training as a waiter. Sal, Julius, and Rose attended the needs of Martha Washington, Jackie, and Patsy. Can you imagine the conversations they heard while working inside the house? However the enslaved community heard about it, they were aware of the landmark Stuart Somerset case that took place in England that year of 1772. Charles Stuart had purchased an enslaved man, James Somerset, in Massachusetts and taken him to England where Somerset escaped to freedom. When Stuart recaptured Somerset and attempted to re-enslave him, supporters of Somerset took the case to court. There, 
the judge decided that there was no statute, no common law in England that authorized slavery. And so Somerset was a free man. At that time, all 13 colonies here in America allowed slavery. But abolitionists were strong, and they hoped that that landmark decision would allow for the abolishment of slavery here in the colonies. Sadly, it was not to be. The judge in England made clear that his decision was only for that one specific case. But nevertheless, knowing that an enslaved person had become free through the laws of the land may have inspired the enslaved people here with a little revolutionary thinking of their own. When George Washington's father, Augustine, was alive, he owned shares in iron mines and co-owned and operated in iron works. There, he smelted the iron into bars, which he then sent to England. England did not allow him to make any products, no. The iron had to be shipped to England where they would make it into tools and armaments, and then the colonists had to buy it back from England. This describes the economic policy of mercantilism, which emphasized great exports and minimum imports, allowing for the promotion of imperialism and colonialism. This is the way Britain thrived on power and built their finances at that time. When England instituted the Navigation Acts, the colonists were allowed only to export with England itself or colonies of England. And then they put heavy duties on sugar and molasses, forcing the colonists to buy more expensive sugar and molasses from the British West Indies rather than the cheaper products from the French West Indies. Well, this incensed those fiercely independent Rhode Islanders. They would have none of that, and they started a brisk illegal smuggling trade. When England found out, they sent ships to stop those smugglers, capture the boats, and destroy their cargoes. On June 9, 1772, Rear Admiral William Duddingston, Scottish commander of the royal ship, the Gaspé, was chasing smugglers around Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. His ship was lured into the shallow waters of the bay where it ran aground. And then Rhode Island men belonging to the Sons of Liberty stormed the boat, captured the captain and crew, put them aboard rowboats, took them away as hostages. And as they were leaving, they set the boat afire. The gas bay burst into flame and burned to the ground. Many historians consider this the first openly hostile act of the American colonists against the British government. Remember, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, who has owned and operated Mount Vernon since 1858, want to represent Mount Vernon as it was when George Washington lived here in 1799. So these buildings were here in that year, but remember, we're back in 1772. So these buildings were not here at that time. Instead, George Washington was relying on the outbuildings that his father had built 
back in the 1730s. But enslaved people worked in those outbuildings as well. At Christmas time, most of them were given four days off. Now, we don't know what their celebrations may have been like because so many religious faiths were practiced. Christianity, Islam, many native African traditions. But to have four days off, that was cause for celebration. A time to spend with family and friends, enjoying the faith, hope, and love they had for one another. Some would choose to take those four days of extended time off and attempt to escape. Across colonial America, they would brave the winter snow and cold in attempt to gain their freedom. We don't have evidence that any of the enslaved people here at Mount Vernon attempted such an escape, but some did in other colonies. Their revolutionary thinking may have led them to seek their own freedom. Please follow me. And so here we are, Mount Vernon by candlelight. Remember, it didn't look like this in 1772. There were no colonnades. The outbuildings were different. If you put your hands up and align your fingers with the chimneys, close one eye, you can see that 15-room mansion that would have existed here in 1772. There was no cupola, that tower on the roof, no triangular pediment. But that 15-room house had eight, nine, even 10 bedrooms. And George and Martha Washington, Jackie and Patsy Custis lived here. One more stop before you begin your journey into the mansion. In 1772, Colonel Washington was away that evening in the Christmas season, uh, busy with uh, colonial affairs. But inside this home, you will meet people who lived and worked and visited here that Christmas season of 1772. As you go through the house, remember how it looks today and in 1799 is not the same as it looked in 1772, but nevertheless, the people represented are those of that revolutionary year, 1772. I hope you'll be able to spot their revolutionary thinking. So please enter the kitchen and enjoy Mount Vernon by candlelight. Welcome, my name is Lucy. I'm one of the enslaved cooks here at Mount Vernon. I say one because my mother, Doll, is the main cook and she's teaching me how to make all the meals for the Colonel and his guests. Now, with everything going on, what with the Washingtons and their family expecting all the, all the Christmas guests, we have to make sure that there is plenty to eat. So my mother, myself, and the others have to make sure that every meal is bountiful and delicious. We'll have handsome platters of meat and fish, and we'll have an assortment of vegetables, sauces, and preserves, and then we'll finish off with mincemeat apple and cherry cherry pies, chest tarts, and my, and my cousin's favorite, the great cake. You think with everything going on, we'd be in a tizzy, but we know what we're doing. It wasn't like the couple years back with the sugar act taxing sugar and molasses. My mother said it was so hard for her to make a decent meal. Do you know how many recipes have molasses in them? More than I care to count. But we don't have to worry about that now. We just have to make sure we get everything done so we can go back to our families tonight. 
those who work in the field get four days off for Christmas, but us in the house, we only get time to ourselves once all the work is done. So when you sit down with your family and friends this Christmas, make sure you cherish your time together. Well, I have to get back to work and I'm sure Mrs. Washington is expecting you. Enjoy your time. Greetings. My name is James Tillman Jr., a family friend of the Washington family from across the river there in Maryland. You know, the Colonel and his family have always invited me into their home, even when we don't always see eye to eye. And these last few years, well, they have shaken the resolve of many a friendship and allegiances, what with Parliament passing proclamations and endless duties. Do you know, I think the Colonel first had his faith in Parliament shaken with the proclamation of 1763. It prevented him from speculating and selling lands that he had acquired after four arduous years of service to king and country. Imposts, duties further vexed him on everything from sugar, tea, newspapers, and other documents of legal import. <laughs> he was so incensed at being treated like a second-class citizen, that he himself introduced the non-importation agreement on taxed goods to the House of Burgesses. Now I vociferously support Parliament. Does that shock you? Well, I mean, it's for our own good. The funds secure our own defense. I refuse to support his non-importation scheme, and yet our friendship remains. But now the action of these so-called sons of liberty and their brazen attack upon his majesty's custom ship, well, that's a step too far. This entire Gaspé affair will go down in the annals of history as nothing more than an act of wanton destruction of property and anarchy. I apologize, I let my feelings on the subject get the better of me. It is the season to set our side of differences and come together. No, the Colonel and I do not agree on every issue, and yet here I am, a guest at Christmas. I hope you all can come together during this holiday season. Good evening and happy Christmas. This is the private bedchamber of General and Mrs. Washington. Mrs. Washington's operating this household from in here, in fact, in the back right of the room. It's the original French desk where she's planning menus and educating her grandchildren, whose portrait you see above the desk. The bed is also original, and it is the bed that George Washington dies on Saturday, December 14th in 1799 at the age of 67.
Why, good evening. It's so nice to see so many friends of the Washingtons. <laughs> After all, this is the season for friends and family, is it not? Allow me to introduce myself. I am the Honorable Henry Lee II. Uh, my wife, uh, Lucy Grimes Lee, and I are also friends of the Washingtons. We have traveled in from our home in Leesylvania to join our good friends for the celebration of the season. It is always so nice to see them. Why, the Colonel and I have been friends for many years. I am so pleased that our families can come together for the merriment of the holidays. It is always so wonderful to have the opportunity to share the stories of our families. How my wife and I eagerly await word of our son Harry's admittance to Princeton. Oh, and I simply cannot wait to hear the latest on Jackie and Patsy. In this season, when there is a chill in the air, nothing warms the soul more than gathering your friends and family about you to be with the ones you love, to see their smiles, to hear their laughter. Oh, it makes the memories that much sweeter. <laughs> but here I am blathering away, and I'm sure you are anxious to see the lady of the house. Last time I saw her, she was downstairs, so you may start that way, but let me send you off with this wish. <clears throat> may all of your Christmases this year be filled with family and friends, and if you're very lucky, may they always be. Happy Christmas. Yes, I need to add a few more places at the table. Excuse me, my name is Frank. Frank Lee. My big brother William and I, we were bought by Colonel Washington about four years ago. Will, he's the Colonel's manservant, and I'm a waiter. I set places at the table, refill glasses, bring the food, and I'm expected to do it quickly and silently, almost like I'm invisible. Being invisible in the home of someone as important as the Colonel means you get to hear some interesting things. Mostly, they read articles in the papers aloud about Parliament taking their freedom and their liberty. One day I overheard them reading an article on a court case in England that had a lot of the Colonel's guests upset. A slave, like me, named James Somerset, was brought up in Boston by a man named Stewart. Back in England, James ran away. His master tried to sell him to Jamaica, but the judge up there, some lord, said there was no common law in England that allowed for slavery. So James? James was free. Do you think that could happen here? I'm not so sure, but wouldn't it be great to be my own person, not some waiter for someone else? Y'all seem like some nice folks, but a Christmas I could spend with my brother instead of caring for others? That would be nice. Until then, I can only hope. But please, you should spend time with your family. Mrs. Washington is in the next room. You shouldn't keep her waiting. I have my duties to attend. Happy Christmas. Oh, good evening, friends, and welcome to Mount Vernon. Colonel Washington and I are so happy to welcome you to our beloved home. And well, I hope that we'll have a 
a happy and peaceful Christmas tide and new year. We've just now returned from Williamsburg, where the Colonel is a member of the House of Burgesses, and it is my most fervent hope that our disagreements with the Parliament in London can be resolved. But of course, here now, we are happily gathered with all of our family. My son Jack has returned from school, and his sister Patsy is in such good health. Do you know they were so little when the Colonel and I were married? Jack was four and Patsy was two. I never had to remind them they should think of him as their father. They called him dearest papa from the very first. Oh, I so look forward to this season of celebrating with our loved ones. Tonight we'll be having a fine collation of desserts with jellies and syllabubs, cakes and marzipan. Of course, I make up the great cake every year. Great cake will be served on Twelfth Night, and it's quite an undertaking. Forty eggs, four pounds of butter, four pounds of sugar, five pounds of flour. To that, you add candied fruit peels and nutmeg, and then it's all doused in brandy before you put the icing on. So we'll have that, as I said, on the last of those 12 days of Christmas, which, of course, that's a special time for the general and I. We were married there on Twelfth Night. Forgive me, friends. I know there's still much for you to see. What a pleasure it's been to welcome you to our home. Happy Christmas to one and all.